If the pastors would uh, quit fellowshipping and settle down. <laughs> well, we've got a couple of celebrities with us. You know, pa- pastors ought to be treated like celebrities, and we've got a couple of celebrities with us tonight. And since we pray for these guys regularly, I want you to, those of you who don't know who they are, to at least be able to associate a face with a name. So we have uh, down here... In the front, we have Pastor Mark Perkins from Front Range Bible Church in Denver and his wife, Renee. And hold up your hand or stand up or act like you've been acknowledged or (laughs) something. He's also a member of the uh, Board of Governors for Chafer Theological Seminary. And behind him is the Rookie of the Year. (laughs) And that's Pastor Dan Ingram from... National Capital Bible Church in Washington, D.C. The National Capital Bible Church. Okay, a couple of announcements are in order before we uh, get rolling along too much. There is a ladies' prayer breakfast scheduled for this Saturday at on January the 7th. It says here B-Y-O-B-B, and I thought that meant bring your own bottle of beer, but I was told it <laughs> means bring your own brown bag. What time are they supposed to... 10 o'clock here, 10 o'clock here, and then um, Dr. Richard Klein will be here this Sunday. Make sure you note on your calendar there will be no Bible class this Thursday night. I leave for Kiev uh, tomorrow evening, no class Thursday. Dr. Klein will be here Sunday morning and next Tuesday uh, night teaching on Proverbs. No class Thursday next week either. Then Charlie Clough will be here Friday, Saturday and Sunday morning, and then there will be no Bible class the 17th or the 19th. I'll return on the 20th, and we'll be back uh, on the schedule after that. One other thing, out on the foyer, on the table in the middle, there is an article entitled Evangelicals on the Durham Trail by D.G. Hart. D.G. Hart at the time that he wrote this, was an associate professor of church history at Westminster Theological Seminary. You sense a little flavor of his high church Presbyterianism uh, here and there in the article. He was also the, uh, he was associate professor of church history and assistant librarian. I think he's gone to the Westminster campus in Southern California now. But this is perhaps the best one-shot article that I have ever read critiquing the contemporary worship movement or the praise and worship movement, which is uh, what you typically find in most churches today. Everybody's gravitated that way. You want your rock band up front with uh, singing your um, short little uh, ditties about Jesus. And a lot of people get confused between personal taste and uh, one pastor told me that somebody came up and said, well, does it mean we can't worship God unless we have a hymn that's over 200 years old? Well, that just misses the point. It has to do with other factors. But this is a great article. And since this is something that constantly comes up and you get people who come in and want to um, uh, bring this into the local church, I thought we'd just nip all that in the bud and we'll have these articles out for people to pick up as time goes by so they can get a good understanding of this. So it's called Evangelicals on the Durham Trail by D.G. Hart. And those who listen to this by way of the Internet can probably do a search on that title and find it that way without any trouble. It's on the Internet. Well, before we get started in our study this evening, let's make sure we're in fellowship. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer. So you can use 1 John 1, 9 if necessary, then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're indeed grateful that you are a sovereign God who controls history and that we can rest and relax in the fact that no matter what happens within history, no matter what chaos or calamities occur, We know that you are in control and you are working out your purposes within human history. Above all, we're thankful that you have sent your son Jesus Christ into human history, that the second person of the Trinity became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glories of the only begotten of the Father. 
And as a result of his incarnation, he qualified himself through his life to go to the cross and die as a substitute for us. And that by uh, faith alone in Christ alone, we can have eternal life. Now, Father, as we study your word this evening and uh, delve into what is a difficult subject for many people, somewhat complex, we pray that you would give us clarity of thought and concentration as we work through these passages that we might more accurately understand your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. A little bit of review. The last two weeks we focused on the doctrine of election. We're coming out of our study in Genesis chapter 25, which talks about Jacob and Esau. When you get into the New Testament, we need to look at how the New Testament utilizes the birth of Jacob and Esau in uh, in a couple of different passages, and the one that is most famous is the one in Romans 9:11, which uses this birth of Jacob and Esau as an example of God's election or selecting sovereign choice in history. Now, this verse in Romans chapter uh, 9, verse 11, is one of the key verses that many people go to to substantiate a doctrine called unconditional election. Unconditional election is the U in the acronym TULIP, which represents the five points of Calvinism. And last week I talked about the two, the two flowers of Protestant theology, the TULIP and the DAISY. The DAISY represents Arminian theology. He loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. Because in Arminian theology, you never know whether or not you're saved. So one day God loves you, and the next day he doesn't. And then Calvinist, five-point Calvinism, is represented by TULIP, the T for total depravity or total inability, the U for unconditional election, the L for limited atonement, Christ died only for those who were elect, uh, the I for irresistible grace, God only extends his efficacious grace to those who are elect, so it's irresistible, and P for perseverance of the saints, that those who are elect will persevere or continue and not reject Christ or fall back permanently in this life. Now, they don't teach that you won't sin or you won't fall disastrously, but they say it won't be a permanent state. Anyhow, we went through about 14 points last time where I ended with Romans 9, and we stopped there because there's just too much to go into, and I didn't want to fry your brains any further than we already had. So let me just review those last few points so we can get our thinking back where we were. Point number 11 read that God makes specific choices in history that are related to his knowledge, that his selection of individuals for specific tasks, his selection of nations is not divorced from his knowledge, but is related to his knowledge. In, in God's omniscience, he knows all actual and possible events. He knows all the potentials that could take place, all the permutations from every different decision. God's knowledge is exhaustive. And he chooses to enact in history that which will bring about A, his greatest glory, and B, demonstrate his integrity and love to the fullest extent. So his, his choices are not made in an arbitrary manner. They're not irrational. They're not made in a way that's divorced from his knowledge. Now that comes into play because the way uh, Calvinism usually expresses things is that God's choice is a result of his foreknowledge, but he can only know what he foreknows. Foreknowledge is determinative, and they are uh, related to one another and determine what actually happens in history. Point number 12. Thus I concluded God chooses in concordance with his knowledge, which includes the knowledge of all possible decisions that man could make in history and that God's choices are not random or arbitrary. And sometimes in the idea of unconditional election, it is expressed that God doesn't, uh, doesn't have a condition for making his decisions. In other words, he doesn't take into account his knowledge. He just selects this person for that, re for that object and this other person for that uh, object and this person for salvation and that person for condemnation and it seems to be presented without paying attention to his omniscience. 
Point number 13. However, in revealing these choices to man, God does not reveal his rationale or the conditions for those decisions. It is not that there is no condition, but there is no condition stated. Now, that's a really important thing to understand. Just because the scriptures don't say that God takes into account certain things doesn't mean that he doesn't take things into account. It just means it's not stated. So it's better to speak of an unmerited election than an unconditional election. And typically what you will find is that a Calvinist will say that if you think that God takes into account what he knows through his omniscience, and he knows that someone is positive to the gospel and that they put their faith in Christ, that they term that as merit. And that, if you know anything about lordship salvation, that really works itself out in terms of that P for perseverance because they view faith as the gift. When they interpret Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, that is the faith, is the gift of God. That's how they interpret that. And that uh, doesn't fit the grammar, doesn't fit the context at all. It's, it's forcing that into the text, and it just doesn't work. The gift is the entire package of salvation, not the faith. So within lordship salvation and five-point Calvinism, faith is meritorious. So thinking within their system, they look at someone who, who believes God takes into account foreseen positive volition or faith as God making decisions based on the merit of the of the human being and if you if faith is non-meritorious which is what we believe and the merit is in the work of Christ then God can take into account positive volition and faith because they're non-meritorious so it does not make God dependent upon man's decisions but God can still remain sovereign in the process then we came to the last point, point number 14. Romans 9.11 is a passage that's cited again and again to prove unconditional election. Now the question we have to address, and the question we have to answer is, but does the context relate to selection to justification and eternity in heaven? Is that what's going on in Romans chapter 9? Is this an example that Paul is using to indicate that God has elected or selected Esau or I, uh, Jacob for salvation and Esau for condemnation. That's how this verse is used. So we have to do uh, some broad work here in Romans 9. I don't want to get distracted in our study by doing a verse-by-verse -verse exegesis of Romans 9 to 11. Uh, but it's important to do an overview of that to understand what's going on here. Romans 9.11 is the key passage where the word election is used. And the word election, as I pointed out last time, is the Greek verb eklego, which means to choose, to make a choice, to select, to elect. It's not a technical word. It is a word that is used of uh, Mary making choices, of different people making choices to do different things. Everybody makes choices, everybody makes decisions, and that's what the word eklego relates to, is people just making an everyday uh, decision about something. So in Romans 9:11, we have the statement related to Esau and Jacob, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Now, if you do microscopic exegesis and you don't look at the context or the structure of a paragraph and a chapter and a book, then it's real easy to go into something like this and just, just hone in on this one thing and say, well, it seems like that's what this is saying. Before anybody was ever born, before either Jacob or Esau were born, God had a purpose and he chose uh, Jacob rather than Esau and it's related to salvation. And at a superficial level, that's what a lot of people come up with. But I would suggest that you have to pay attention to the flow of what Paul is saying in Romans 9 to 11, and then you have to fit that into the whole structure of Romans. In other words, what we get into trouble sometimes when we just do uh, microscopic exegesis and deal with a passage, a, a verse or two verses without relating it to, the, to everything around it. You just look at the, at the leaf and spend all your time uh, examining and analyzing a leaf and you forget to look at the tree 
or how the tree relates to the whole forest or the whole ecological system of the planet. So you have to take that bird's eye view and this really helps us to understand uh, what's going on in the context of Romans chapter 9. Now the verse that everybody goes to is in verse 13 which says, As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And the argument is that God loves, has his elective love on specific individuals, and he rejects and condemns others. And so that verse is quoted, and it in fact comes out of a passage in the Old Testament in Malachi 1, uh, 1 through 3. Malachi 1, 1, the burden of the Lord, of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. You know, Malachi was the only Italian prophet in the Old Testament. It's, it's Malachi. You heard of the Malachi papers? <laughs> I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Now, this is the Old Testament context. Now, let's go back and review a basic principle. Whenever we're, we're dealing with an Old Testament quotation in the New, we have to understand the context of the original situation in the Old Testament. You can't just understand what Paul is saying in Romans 9 without understanding the backdrop of Genesis 25, which we've already studied, and the backdrop of Malachi. Once we get into, the, into Malachi a little bit, you'll see what the comparison is and why it's not saying what so many people think it's saying. But before we get into that, let's stop and just talk a minute about Romans, uh, the overall argument of Romans. Think through what Paul is saying. So when I use the term argument, I'm using it like a lawyer would use it in a courtroom. That in every book of the Bible, the writer's writing, it's writing, writing good literature. He has what you might say is a topical sentence or main idea. And he takes that thesis that's expressed usually early on in the epistle and he builds a case for it. He, he argues for a particular position. And in Romans, you have one of the most uh, consistently logical epistles in the New Testament where, where Paul is arguing for the vindication of God's justice in history. And that makes righteousness and justice, or the Greek word dikaiosune, a key concept for understanding the entire uh, book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, that is the gospel, is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also for the Greek. And as Paul develops his argument of Romans, which is a defense of the justice of God, in relationship to human history, he's going to relate it to the Jew and to the Gentile. So he's going to relate God's justice in history to both the Jew and God's plan for the Jews and God's plan for the Gentiles. This is further explained in verse 17, for he says, For in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So the key idea that we're going to see that flows through the whole uh, epistle of Romans is a defense of the righteousness of God as it's revealed in human history. And Paul constantly relates the Jews and Israel to this theme of God's justice. In chapter 1, verses 18 to 521, which is the foundation for the rest of the epistle, Paul relates Israel to the righteousness of God and the doctrine of justification. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, he demonstrates that man has fallen, that man has violated the righteousness of God. In chapter 4, he demonstrates that the only way to be 
consistent with God's righteousness is for God to do it and that uh, happens with the imputation of righteousness at the point of faith alone in Christ alone that's Romans chapter 4 Romans chapter 5 we get the results of that which is reconciliation we have peace with God because we are justified in chapters 6 7 and 8 Paul talks about this spiritual life uh, of the believer and in 6 1 through 8 17 In there he relates Israel to the righteousness of God and sanctification through the contrast of grace and law. Major section in Romans chapter 7 deals with Paul's view of the law and that the law cannot produce righteousness. And the law, of course, was given to Israel. Third, in chapter 8, verses 18 to 39, Paul relates Israel to the righteousness of God and glorification. Now, this isn't the main idea of each of these sections, but within each of these sections, Paul is relating the righteousness of God to God's plan for Israel. And at the end of chapter 8, we run into a little conundrum, because after eight chapters of talking about the justice of God and his righteousness, and he's addressing a congregation in Rome that's made up of both Jews and Gentiles, what do you think the Jews are thinking? Well, wait a minute. Back there in the Old Testament 2,000 years ago, God promised Abraham that a land, seed, and blessing, and now he's going over to the Gentiles. That doesn't seem very fair or just to us. How can God's present dealings with Israel be consistent with his justice? He seems to have thrown Israel away, and now he's he's, uh, going over to the Gentiles. So how can you relate the present circumstance of Israel to the justice of God? And that is why Paul takes what appears to be a diversion in Romans 9 through 11 in order to demonstrate that what God is doing in history is perfectly consistent with his justice. And in the end, he will fulfill all of his Old Testament promises and all of the covenants to Israel. So that when you get to the end of Romans chapter 11, Paul says, in in this manner all Israel will be saved. And it's based upon the prophets and the promises given to the fathers in the Old Testament. So you have to see this flow in terms of Paul's argument. Otherwise, when you you get into the details of the middle of uh, Romans 9, uh, 10 through 13, if you don't understand what he's talking about, it's easy to misinterpret it. So a fourth point is in Romans 9, 1 through 11, 36, Paul relates Israel to the righteousness of God and the vindication of God's justice in his dealings with rebellious Israel that's on negative volition and has rejected Jesus as Messiah. And then in the last section of the epistle, in 12.1 to 16.27, Paul relates Israel to the righteousness of God and its practical application. So Israel is in the backdrop of every single one of these sections. Remember, it's set up at the beginning to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. So you have this nice structure, and Paul is rigorously logical as he develops uh, his argument. So now that we look at this flow and we see that there's a, they, that G- Paul is relating God's righteousness to Israel in every section, and this center section that we're looking at, 9 1 to 11 36, deals with God's righteousness in terms of how he's dealing with Israel in the first century, shift, the shift to the Gentiles in the church age. How's that set up? So that we have a structure of just, just to look at Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11. First of all, in Romans 9, there's a demonstration of the righteousness of God in his rejection of natural Israel that God is perfectly righteous to reject Israel because they've rejected the Messiah, that he is, he is going to discipline the nation and they have violated the righteousness of God and they're coming under divine discipline and that God is perfectly within his, uh, w- within his purview, within his authority to discipline Israel. In chapter 10, Paul demonstrates that that rejection is based on Israel's corporate neglect of the revelation given to them. Historically, he is saying they have rejected God's revelation to them as a nation. And then in chapter 11, he answers the question, has God permanently cast away his people? And of course, the answer is that he has not. 
And the main interpretive issue, the main hermeneutical issue, is whether or not Paul's answer to this question reveals a distinctive future in God's plan for ethnic corporate Israel that is different from that of the present gospel era. So the point I'm making there is if Romans 11 is talking about God's plan for a future for ethnic corporate Israel, then that establishes the fact that what Paul is talking about in 9 through 11 is corporate Israel and God's plan for corporate Israel. And he's not talking about individual selection. He's talking about corporate selection. He's talking about God's choice of Israel as a nation. He's not talking about the selection of Israel individually for salvation. And that fits the flow of what Paul is saying in a much better way. So that brings us to the key question that we have to address. Is Paul talking about individual selection to salvation? Is Paul talking about individual selection to justification? When Paul talks about Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, is he saying Jacob I chose for individual justification salvation and Esau I rejected for individual justification salvation or is he talking about them as representative heads of the of the national groups that come from them that's the issue if he's talking about corporate selection then none of this has anything to do with entry into the body of Christ and receiving eternal life. It has to do with God's plan to bless one group over and above another group in time. So that's the governing question that we have to deal with. Now sometimes it's a good idea to read the last chapter in the book before you read the first chapter so you know where the author is going. Now, that may not be good if you're reading an Agatha Christie book or if you're reading a Dorothy Sayers, but if you're reading uh, technical theology or a philosophy book sometimes, that's a good thing to do. I remember years ago, uh, Charlie had recommended reading Francis Schaeffer's trilogy, and if ever any of you have ever read through books like Escape from Reason or The God Who Is There, then you know what a, a brain burner, brain cell burner that can be. And I read, read, kept reading Escape from Reason, Escape from Reason, a little bitty 90-page book, and I kept reading it, and, and I just wasn't clicking. Finally, I just forced myself to read through the whole book, and when I got to the last chapter, I realized where he was headed. So then I went back and read it again. Once I figured out where he was going, what he was trying to say, then the earlier chapters made sense, and that's often what you have to do if you're reading technical nonfiction is, and I learned this later in seminary, read the prologue because that's where the author is going to tell you what he's trying to say and why, and then read the conclusion, and that's where he ties everything together. And then go back, look at the table of contents, see what the titles for the chapters are because that's the flow of his, of his thought, and then read the chapters in between. That way you will gain more from it than if you just try to plow ahead without knowing where you're going. So if we look at where Paul's going, where he's headed is the, at the end of Romans chapter 11. Romans 9 to 11 must be understood as a consistent, integrated uh, thought flow. So in verse 28 of chapter 11, we have the use of the word election. And there Paul says, concerning the gospel, they, that is Israel, are enemies for your sake. But concerning the election, they, that is Israel, are beloved for the sake of of the fathers. Now one of the questions that we have to answer when we get into this is is this talking about an election to justification to individual justification salvation or this is this talking about a corporate election of the nation to a position of blessing in human history. First thing we should note is that the phrase sake of their fathers they are beloved for the sake of their fathers at the end of the verse, tells us that this, his understanding, is directly related to the Abrahamic covenant. That's the fathers that he's talking about. Who are the three patriarchs of Israel? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So for the sake of their fathers, now what did God do with the fathers? 
He promised a, a covenant to Abraham. It was reconfirmed to Isaac, and it was reconfirmed to Jacob. And we've seen that in our study uh, through Genesis, that there's uh, a continuation of this covenant. That's the foundation for understanding the analogy that we see a little earlier in Romans uh, chapter 11. Look at verse uh, verse 16. He's going to give uh, an example, two examples actually. Verse 16 he says, For if the first fruit is holy, he uses an analogy from baking bread. If the first fruit, that is the first fruit of the harvest, has been set apart, then the lump which comes from is also holy. Uh, he's, and then he goes to a second analogy. He says, if the root is holy, that is the root of a plant, if that's holy or set apart, then that which comes out of it, that is the tree or the branches, that would also be holy or sanctified. Verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you, that is the you Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them. So you start off with an olive tree. This represents Israel. The root of that olive tree represents the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. And then you come along with the olive tree, and it's not producing fruit. So you re the, the natural olive tree wasn't producing fruit. That's Israel. So some of the branches are removed. That's discipline. And in their place, you have grafted in, you have... Uh, Gentiles grafted into the place of blessing. It's not talking about salvation because if you had them broken off, then that would be a loss of salvation. So salvation is not the point in the analogy. The point in the analogy of the olive tree is who is receiving the, the nourishment from the root. And the root is the Abrahamic covenant. So God brings in and grafts in the wild olive branches, which are the Gentiles, who receive the benefit and blessing of the root. That's the promise of in the Abrahamic covenant, that God would bless all nations uh, through Abraham. And so Paul says in verse 17, If some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, don't boast against the branches, that is, those that were broken off. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. It all comes from the grace of God in, in giving this covenant to Abraham. So that's the foundation is the Abrahamic covenant as it was laid out to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers, the patriarchs of Israel. So the first thing we know when we look at Romans eleven twenty eight, is that the sake of the fathers indicates that the basis for the election is the Abrahamic covenant. Now, was the Abrahamic covenant a covenant given to Abraham in order to get him justified, or was he already justified? He was already justified. We've studied that in Genesis 15, 6. The perfect tense there should be, the, the, the Greek perfect should, I mean, Hebrew perfect should be taken as a, as a pluperfect in its content, co context that Abraham had already believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. So before God called Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Abraham had already been justified. And the Abrahamic covenant was like a royal grant covenant in the ancient world where a faithful servant is being rewarded with an additional uh, blessing. And so Abraham, as a faithful believer, is being rewarded with this covenant. He wasn't the only believer at the time. That we know that there was Melchizedek at the same time and that there were others who were believers. But Abraham was chosen by God for a specific task of blessing God would work through his descendants. He would reveal himself through his descendants. Scripture would come through his descendants. All of this would come through the descendants of, of Abraham. It was not related to salvation. It was related to blessing, post-salvation blessing. So we note that the foundation for the election is the sake of their fathers. The they in the passage, therefore, doesn't refer to the, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. That doesn't refer to selection to individual justification or individual condemnation, but selection of the line of Abraham for special blessing. Now, when it says concerning the gospel, they, Israel, are enemies, if, you have to, if you're going to take this as referring to individual election, 
then this would have to refer to every single individual Jew. Well, what about Paul? Paul's a Jew. What about Peter? Peter's a Jew. What about the 5,000 that got saved on the day of Pentecost? What about the 4,000 that got saved a couple of chapters later? Weren't they all Jews? Yeah, they were all Jews. So this doesn't refer to individuals. It refers to the corporate group. It was Israel as a corporate entity under the leadership of the Pharisees that rejected Jesus as their Messiah, even though thousands of individual Jews accepted Jesus as their Messiah, corporately they rejected him. This is Paul's argument back at the beginning of Romans chapter 11. He said, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's all, he recognizes the fact that not all Jews are enemies, but corporately they are in a position of rejection of Christ and following uh, their leadership in rejecting Jesus' claims as a Messiah. So second, a third thing that we need to note is when it says that the election was on the basis of the fathers, it can't be cons thought of as unconditional, can it? Because he's saying it was on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant. There's a condition stated there. So Romans 11.28 cannot be used to substantiate individual selection for salvation. It's not individual, it's corporate. And we get this reinforced if we just back up a, a few verses to Romans 11, verse 25. There Paul says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. God has a plan. And temporarily he has set aside Israel. Why? Because they made real decisions in time. There was a true contingency in the kingdom offer. Jesus came and said, the kingdom is at hand. And they said, well, you're not the Messiah. So the kingdom was postponed. That was real contingency indicating real freedom in human history. And so the kingdom was, was postponed. And as a result of their rejection, God grafts in the Gentiles. He goes to the plan where he brings in the church, which is a new corporate entity made up of both Jew and Gentile. But within the body of Christ, ethnicity no longer matters because the old Mosaic law is no longer in effect. So Paul says in verse 25, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. In other words, there's a part of Israel that's not blind. There will be individual Jews that are saved in this dispensation, but corporately the nation has been set aside. God is no longer focused on Israel. He will go back to Israel when, when the tribulation comes when the fullness of Gentiles has come in. Okay, let's jump back now to the beginning of the chapter. Romans 11, verse 5. Romans 11, 5, Paul says, Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Well, that sounds like he's talking about individual salvation. Actually, he's not. He's talking about a group. He's talking about a corporate entity. Actually, he's talking about two groups. There's a large group of ethnic Israel, and within that larger group of ethnic Israel, there is another corporate group that makes up real Israel, which are those that have uh, put their faith in the Lord for salvation. So in Romans 11:5, he says, Even so then, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, and if by grace, then it is no longer of works. They don't merit their uh, position in the remnant. It's because of faith alone and Christ alone. If by grace it's no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks. See the corporate Israel again. Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect, that is the saved remnant within corporate Israel. They have attain, obtained it, and the rest were blinded. They were blinded because of their rejection of Jesus as a Messiah. Now, as we look at these two different groups, we have to pull together two verses, one at the beginning of this section in Romans 9, 6, 
and one at the end of this section in Romans 11:26. Have I fried your brains yet? A few people are looking like they're, wait, wait a minute, I'm not sure where we are. Well, we'll review this after I come back from Kiev. You'll have forgotten it all by then. I may have too. Romans 9, 6 says, But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Now, what does that mean? They're not all Israel that are of Israel. In other words, there's two groups. There is an ethnic group, and there is an ethnic plus regeneration group. We come to the end of the section in Romans eleven twenty six. Paul says, And so, that is, in, thusly, in the following manner, hutos, and so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So all Israel will be saved. Is that all Israel ethnic Israel, or all Israel, the Israel not all Israel is Israel, the, the, the smaller group? It's a smaller group. It's the group of believers. So we can, um, there we go, oh, got the slide in the wrong place. You have two groups. The larger group is ethnic Israel, all those who are ethnic Jews. They are, related to, they are related to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by birth. Then you have a subgroup. These are the Jews that are regenerate, that have trusted in uh, either in the Old Testament anticipation of Jesus as Messiah or they accepted Jesus as Messiah at the first advent. This would be true Israel. And true Israel are the Jews that pay attention to Matthew, to Jesus' warnings in Matthew chapter, uh, what is that, Matthew 24, when Jesus says, when you see these signs taking place, you will drop what you're doing and head for the hills. You're going to go to the mountains. You're going to head into the hills of Judea. You're going to cross over. You're going to go to Basra and go down there behind Petra, uh, where we're going to go on our trip in, uh, in, in June. And there you're going to hide out in Basra, there was a Basra in Connecticut about 15 miles from Preston. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that area across the Jordan in, in, in present uh, Jordan, just south of Petra, which is where they would the, the remnant will flee. Now, you're not going to pay attention to Jesus' statement to head to the hills unless, if you're not saved, you're at least positive. And on the way, you're going to get positive because by the time you, they get over there, uh, all hell has literally broken loose and the Antichrist and, the, and all the armies are converging on Jerusalem and Jerusalem and Israel are, are about to be wiped from the face of the planet and these Jews who flee to Basra are going to cry out to the Lord, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what Jesus said at the end of Matthew 23 that until you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, I won't come. And they're finally going to recognize him as Messiah and call upon him to del deliver them. And that's when Jesus Christ returns at the end of the tribulation. Second advent comes down to rescue Israel at the last possible moment. And thus all Israel is saved. Why is all Israel saved? Because the rest of them are all dead. They didn't follow Jesus' command to get out of, go to the hills. So that's all Israel is saved. The remnant is saved at that point, And that's ethnic Israel plus regeneration. Okay, that gives us a little bit of a broad overview and where we're headed in terms of the argument and the flow of the argument to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 tells us that Paul is clearly talking about corporate Israel and that, that God's choice of cor cor corporate Israel in the Old Testament has not been abrogated by their rejection of Christ that God is still faithful to them and God will eventually save and deliver them in the future time and God will fulfill all of his promises which he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So now let's go back to Romans chapter uh, 9. Romans chapter 9. We'll pick up the immediate, immediate context. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. We're just going to take this paragraph by paragraph so you get the main flow of what Paul is saying. In verses 1 through 5, Paul expresses his sorrow over the Jews' corporate rejection of Jesus as Messiah. Because they corporately rejected him, there are individuals who are lost. But he's expressing his sorrow over the Jews' corporate rejection of Christ because it is a corporate offer. 
That means that, Je that Jesus Christ came and offered himself as Messiah to bring in the kingdom to the entire corporate entity of the nation, and the leaders rejected him, and he, as a result, he was crucified. So in verse 1, Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing wit witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a, a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who were Israelites to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises. So he is grieved because as a corporate entity, Israel has rejected Christ, and as a result, the vast majority are, are lost. Now look who he's talking about. When he says that he has great sorrow because of his countrymen, because they have rejected Christ, who's he talking about? Every single Jew? No. Because he's saved, Peter's saved, the other disciples are saved, 5,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost, 4,000 got saved a little while later, a lot of Jews are saved. Jews are saved in Rome, Jews are saved every place Paul went on his missionary journeys, he went to the Jew first and to the Gentile. There's lots of Jews that are saved. So he's not talking about individuals, he's talking about uh, a corporate group. This is re reinforced by the th things that are said in verses 2 through 5. Look on the overhead. He has great sorrow and continual grief in, my, in his heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen. Plural or singular? Plural. He's talking about a group of individuals. My countrymen according to the flesh. That's the larger circle. These are the ones that are ethnic Israel. Who are Israelites to whom pertain the adoption. Israel was adopted as God's firstborn. Is this corporate or individual? It's corporate. It's the whole nation as a nation, as an entity. The glory. They, the nation had the, the Shekinah dwelling of God. Where? In the tabernacle and the temple. The whole nation had the glory of the presence, the Shekinah of the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. The covenants. Who were the covenants given to? They were given to the nation as a whole, to a corporate group of people. The giving of the law. Who was the law given to? The corporate nation again. The service of God and the promises. All of this focuses on a group of people, a corporate entity. It's not dealing with, with individuals. When it says the giving of the law, the service, and the promises, and then verse 5, of whom are the fathers... And from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Now, whom are the fathers? Who are the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it ties it right back to the Abrahamic covenant and the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant, which is what he's going to end up with when he gets down to Romans chapter 11. And just as a side note for those of you who are uh, concerned about the Da Vinci Code and what's going to come out, notice it says that Jesus Christ is the eternally blessed God. You have a clear statement of the deity of Christ in the, in the first century. Gee, they didn't invent that at the Council of Nicaea, did they? That was clearly taught all through the first century. Okay, let's move on to Romans 9, 6 to 13. In Romans 9, 6 to 13, what Paul is saying is that it isn't that the word of God failed or that his integrity or justice failed, but that not all Israel is Israel. Not all Israel has responded to the grace of God. So in the first uh, five verses, he s expresses his sorrow over the Jews' corporate rejection of Jesus as Messiah. But not all rejected him. There are individuals, many individuals, who trusted Christ. It's not that the word of God failed, he goes on to say, or that his integrity or justice failed, but that because not all Israel is Israel, there is a, a large group, the corporate group, that rejected Jesus' claims as Messiah. And so in God's sovereignty, he is temporarily setting aside the nation and putting them under divine discipline during the time of the Gentiles. So in verse 6 he says, But it's not that the word of God has taken no effect. In other words, it's not that the word of God failed. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And that's our diagram. They are not all Israel who are Israel. They are not all true Israel, that is, regenerate Israel, just because they're related genetically to Abraham. 
That's where, what he goes on to say in verse 7. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. Notice he doesn't even mention Ishmael, but that's the point, is that if you're a descendant of Abraham through Ishmael or through Esau, then you're not an, you do not inherit the blessing of the promise. Verse 7, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 8, put this on the overhead. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So there's a contrast between the children of the flesh, those who are genetically related, and those who are children of the promise are counted as a seed. Now, wh who are the children of the promise? That's a key idea that has to be understood. But what was the promise? The promise was given in the Abrahamic covenant. Now, everybody ought to know the answer to this. The promise in the Abrahamic covenant is for what? Salvation in heaven? Justification? No. Land, seed, and blessing. That's what the promise is. It's not talking, the promise to Abraham wasn't a promise of soteriology. It was a promise of blessing in time and in eternity related to the covenant. This is clarified in the next two verses. For this, in verse 9, for this is the word of promise. Ah, see, that defines promise for us in context. The children of the promise are those that are related to the promise given in Genesis chapter 18 verses 10 and 14 when God said to Abraham, it's going to be through Sarah that you're going to have a son. And we went through that whole chapter talking about the, the, when God for the first time specified that it definitely would, would be Sarah who would give birth to the promised child and the child would be a son. And at that point, God said, at this time, next year, I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. So the children of the promise is related to the promise of the covenant, of the Abrahamic covenant. Then we come to verse 9. And we note also that he doesn't say anything about Ishmael. He doesn't mention Ishmael's, and Ishmael was already late teenager by this time. Doesn't mention Ishmael's salvation. Doesn't in, in say anything about uh, Ishmael's lack of salvation. But in fact, what we do have is several statements in Genesis talking about how God was with Ishmael. Genesis 16, 10 through 12. In Genesis 21, 17 through 20. In his promise to Hagar, God promised that he would uh, bless Ishmael and that Ishmael would have abundance and that God would watch over him. God would be with Ishmael. But who got the greater blessing? See, it wasn't a choice of Isaac gets it all and Ishmael is, goes through life uh, suffering and under condemnation. Ishmael received blessing, but Isaac got the greater blessing. That was the issue. It's a corporate, corporate blessing. Then we come to verse 10. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac. So we talk about it. There was a selection process of which way the blessing was going to go in terms of Isaac instead of I Ishmael, and now it goes on in the next generation with the twins, the descendants of Isaac and Rebekah. And that's our context. It's taken us 55 minutes just to set up the context to understand what's going on here. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. And it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, and now he quotes from Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Again, we have to ask the question, is this corporate selection to blessing or individual selection to justification and eternal life. He's not talking about the individuals. He's talking about corporate selection to a special place of blessing in time. That was what the issue was all about, as we'll see when we get into the uh, pottage and the lentil soup and then uh, later on when Esau goes hunting and, and I, uh, Jacob comes in and deceives Isaac. All this has to do with, with uh, not them as individuals, but the passing on of the blessing. Now the question is, when you have this statement, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, is this talking about them as individuals, or is it talking about them as representing 
the groups that come from them. Well, that's where we go back and we look at the or original context in Genesis 25 and 22, verses 22 and 23. But the children struggled together within her. Rebecca was concerned because she was going through the, these intense uh, pains as there was all of this uh, activity going on in the womb. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, What, two individuals are struggling in your womb? No, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. The older what? The, the older nation shall serve the younger. And this is how it worked out in history. I want you to note that nothing is said in this context about justification salvation. No one knows if Esau was saved or not. The verse where people go to to argue that Esau was not saved is in Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews 12, we have a warning. Hebrews 12, 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. What's the context? We've been going through Hebrews long enough to where you ought to understand the context. The context is he's addressing believers and warning them that if you fall into carnality and you let mental attitude sin, such as bitterness, uh, dominate your thinking, that it's not only going to uh, put you out of fellowship for the time being, create, create other problems, but it's going to jeopardize your eternal inheritance, your future inheritance. And so he says, lest there be, verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sh sold his birthright. What's the birthright? That's his future blessing, his inheritance. Now, is that saying that he lost salvation or he didn't have salvation? Not at all. In fact, if the analogy is going to hold true, Esau was truly was saved. And what he did was because he lived for the moment and he lived for his own fleshly appetites and he didn't care about the future, he, he wasn't concerned at all about what was going to happen next year or in the next decade or in the next century. He was willing to give up his birthright just to satisfy his, his present hunger. And this would indicate more likely, if the analogy holds true, is that he was saved more, more than he was unsaved. So he, Hebrews 12, 15 through 17 doesn't say anything about his salvation. Hebrews 12, 17 goes on to say, For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance. And the word there is metanoia, uh, or metanoia, and it has the idea of change. He, no matter how hard he pleaded with Isaac, no matter how hard he pleaded with Jacob, he couldn't reverse what he had already done. He sold his inheritance. So even though he had tremendous remorse, and even though he sought it with tears, and even though he wanted to change, he could not change. He couldn't reverse the decision that he had made. Now that brings us up to Malachi. And since it's 9 o'clock, we're going to have to stop here, and we'll come back next time, and we'll look at how Malachi is used. And I'm going to give you just a quick preview. In the setting in Malachi is that the people are hardened. I gave you a handout, so you just keep it till next time. It gives you a little timeline so you can understand where Malachi fits in the flow of Israel's history. But the point is that when Malachi is writing to the Jews, it's a time when they're on negative volition. They've rejected the provision of God. They are ignoring the temple and the Levites, and as a result, God is disciplining the, the nation. And before Malachi lowers the boom against them in the book of Malachi, the first thing he reminds them of is God has made an unconditional covenant with them, he, and that's the point that God is making when he says, I love Jacob and I hated Esau. In other words, I chose Jacob to be the person to receive the greater blessing, not Esau, and I haven't gone back on my word. So when you get into the rest of Malachi, God is lowering the boom on Israel and threatening them with discipline, but he reminds them up front that he loves them, that they still have a covenant, and he's not going to go back on his covenant. Well, what's happening in Romans? Golly gee, the uh, Jews have again rejected God. They've rejected the Messiah. They're in negative volition. God is threatening them with divine discipline. If they don't respond before too long, there's going to be a destruction, the fifth cycle of discipline in A.D. 70. 
and you have the same kind of scenario. So what Paul is doing in Romans 9 through 11 is he is showing that at the very beginning, just as Malachi did at the beginning of his book, is that God has not uh, rejected you permanently. God has entered into these covenants, and he's not going to reject those covenants. And it was Jacob that was chosen, and God still has a plan for the nation Israel. And even though they may go through a period of time when the Gentiles receive the blessing, there will eventually be a restoration of Israel. And so what are we talking about here? We're talking about corporate corporate. Uh, selection for blessing in time, or are we talking about individual selection to justification and salvation? Again and again and again, the whole context of Romans 9 to 11 is corporate selection for blessing in time. And that's how we need to understand this part of election. Now, I'm not doing an extensive study on the doctrine of election or looking at all the passages, just as it relates to Jacob and Esau. So we'll come back in three weeks. When I return from Kiev, and we will pick up and have a review of this and then finish up with Romans 9 to 11 and Malachi uh, 1, 1 through 3 with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you for the clarity that it gives us. We thank you that as we study this, it reminds us of your faithfulness, that you never go back on your word, even though it may seem in our lives as if you desert us, as if we're going through the difficulty of divine discipline or just uh, intense adversity. Nevertheless, we know that you will never leave us or forsake us and that you have plans for us that are for good and not for evil. Father, we pray that you would continue to remind us of your faithful, steadfast, loyal love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.